great, Cameron. Thanks a lot. And um, hello to everybody, and thanks for joining us for a, a late afternoon fire, fireside chat. Um, we have Patty. Um, to put this in context, I'm going to ask both of them uh, just to give us um, a brief description of what their job is with interaction, as well as a little bit of their experience. So, Patty, why don't we start with you? So, oh, I'm not going to follow the slides very heavily, just but I have them there for people if they want to learn more about interaction. Okay. Um, but for those of you who, who, I'm not sure who's on the line, but we have some overlap in our membership with Envoad. We have um, 17 members that are the same organizations within yourselves that work with us directly as members. Th three of your affiliates um, or three of your organizations are also affiliates with us and one of your partners. Um, so there's you know, definitely some overlap within, within our membership and expertise that we can be bringing to bear as, as peer learning. Um, the, the focus of interaction that's different, I think, than from Envoad, or at least historically from Envoad, is we focus very much on the international side of, of response. So while many of our members may also do national level response or, or have a domestic arm, you know, we're, we're focused on their international aspect. We have about 190 members at the moment, um, both working in the development uh, sphere as well as the humanitarian sphere, some of them multi-mandated. Um, we are, you know, basically work to be a convener a thought leader for them, trying to bring together messaging. We have a public policy side, um, doing you know, advocacy on the Hill, working on budgets for NGOs, for foreign, foreign affairs budgets, um, you know, also on, on messaging and impact related to specific countries. So there's, there's a breadth of work we're doing related to, I, I guess, you know, bridging together as much as possible. Obviously, some of our members are also have international arms um, such as Save the Children or, or um, you know, even the American Red Cross being connected with the IFRC. I mean, so it's, it's, it's while we are American in, in definition, um, it, we are not by any means American in limitations in, in how we look at the world and, you know, definitely in our influence and how we bring things beyond the, the, our base in Washington. On the next slide, you can see we talk about, you know, various issues that our members work on. And this is just to give you a breath of the idea of, you know, again, looking at how does this potentially connect with some of the work your own members are doing domestically. I mean, you have similar responses, maybe a different approach to that response or a different scale of the work that's being done. But, you know, the needs overseas, the needs domestically are often, in an emergency, are often the same. It's just uh, what we're doing and how we're doing it and with whom we're doing it is what varies, but, but a lot of the same um, struggles and challenges related to the sectorals and the coordination between them, um, you know, exist, and we do our best to try and support that across the breadth of our membership, and as I said, um, also along the, the um, uh, line of response from, from humanitarian development. Uh, we also have a democracy and rights group which works within, a uh, subgroup which works within our development, so I, I just want to make sure it was clear that you know, we, we, it, is a, it is across many um, expertises that, that we try and support our membership. Um, I wanted to then take a moment to just drill down into our humanitarian team because I think that's where there is the strongest connectivity from our conversations we've had in preparing for this webinar in what, you know, we, we can offer as an expertise and lessons learned and, and experiences and approaches that are maybe happening at the international uh, arena that, that can maybe be brought to bear domestically. Um, so I wanted to take a, a moment to just talk about what we do here. Um, again, we, we do consultation, coordination, and advocacy, uh, very much focused on forcibly displaced uh, people affected by conflict, refugees, internally displaced populations. Um, we have, you know, exactly looking at work related to protection and assistance needs, but we also do some work um, on the operations, security, partnerships, gender coordination. So it's, it's a, a team of 16 here, an interaction on the humanitarian side, and so we have quite a few different work streams that we're doing. I tried to just highlight them in, into general areas, so I want to touch on those briefly so you can get an idea of, of some of the more specific things that we do, but this in, in no means is the entirety of, of what we do, but I was trying to look at places where the connectivity may be would be um, clearest. Um, humanitarian partnerships on this one, it's, it's a lot of the work. I mean, Julian's team uh, actually does the, the you know the majority of this, which is 
engaging with United Nations agencies on how you know, some of the bilateral relationships work, hopefully towards the collective, but the bilateral relationships, for example, UN High Commissioner for Refugees and how they're working with their NGO partners on the ground, both international and national. Um, and this can be everything from, you know, uh, respect for individual expertises and, 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 and you know, collaboration to actual the nitty gritty, what does the grant agreement look like? Um, and how do we how do we monitor it? So I mean there, there's a the partnership there is, is both you know the macro and the micro side of partnership. Another thing that we do is field missions and I think this is where you know we're bringing a lot of the policy to bear, which is you know, okay, we have uh, a great breadth of experience on the team. I think it's over 50 years when you count up amongst the team you know, how much um, the staff have worked in the field. It's, it's 50 years of, of experience working in responses. And we try and use that experience to, to, to go back, you know, to influence policy, but also in visiting back to the field and looking at how do we offer some assistance and, 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 and bring that expertise um, into some of the co uh, conversations in, you know, the struggles that individuals might be feeling. At field level, it's a little bit of, of helping individuals really kind of see the forest for the trees um, kind of thing. You know, when, you, when you, we know very well from personal experience, when you're in the midst of it, it's really hard to lift your head up and see the, the bigger picture and, and the different drivers and influencers to how things are happening. So we, we do some of those missions to try and assist with that. We have uh, a representational role at uh, Global Fora. The largest of this in terms of, of you know, bandwidth demand is the Interagency Standing Committee, which was formed by a UN General Assembly resolution, which also formed the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance, OCHA, which may be familiar to some of you. This fora is basically where there's a collective of NGOs, mostly United Nations agencies, but also NGOs and the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement, to try and figure out how do we work collectively for a better response. Um, and so there's a lot that happens within this at, at numerous levels, um, everywhere from the principles down to the field level, and in just trying to make sure we figure out um, and how to work. And this is where, you know, the next slide I'll get into a little bit, the cluster approach, the documentary country team. This all comes from the IESC and how they work. But we also do things like the World Humanitarian Summit, um, the Grand Bargain. The, I mean, I get, these are lots of processes that require webinars all of their own to kind of get into the depth of. But it's just to let you know that we do a representational role on behalf of the NGO community, bringing commitments, demands, expectations, you know, whatever it may call for, forward um, to these on behalf of the NGO community to try and bring the experience and learning of the NGOs into um, how policies developed at a global level. And then um, Julian kind of referred to this briefly, but we have crisis-specific working groups which look at country crises and try and get into some of the dialogue and, and discussion about what are some of the issues facing these countries. They have a public policy lean to a degree in that, in that some of the things that come out would be, for example, a letter to the administration or a letter to the individuals on the Hill, but they also have things about, you know, trying to influence other actors such as the United Nations, looking at budget needs, um, you know, support for OCHA's funding. New, you know, so, so those, can, those can also go into also details such as discussions on, you know, current security situations and attacks and what NGOs are doing on the ground or bureaucratic impediments. So they, they really, you know, re, um, are influenced by the membership themselves. We don't necessarily drive what they're talking about. What we try and ensure that they're talking about um, items that can, you know, directly uh, improve the response. The, a similar approach is taken to the thematic groups, and, and this, again, it's a member. These are member groups, but these are more specific to where we have staff expertise and where we are able to help drive some thinking and movement on, on wider sectoral issues. And lastly, um, just wanted to be humanitarian advocacy and policy development, and this is, um, you know, I touched on it a little bit in terms of things we do for some of our NGO representation work, but it goes beyond that. It's also about trying to ensure, you know, for example, for protection, trying to help drive the creation of protection policy that will influence how the system responds in protection crises, um, you know, that we're looking as well on, on, on the, as I said, the next slide, the, the items about how we work in response, how do we do joint needs assessments, how, you know, a lot of that uh, bring, bringing the voice of the NGO sector in. So. This is an area where I mean, we can we can definitely share more information over time in terms of where our strategy documents and what work streams feed all of these, and it'll give people a greater picture. But 
but there's also a little bit of, of inside baseball risk in that, you know, some of these things are maybe, there's some connectivity to the work you're doing, but they also may be somewhat further afield for, for some of you and how they work, but we're happy to get into more details. Um, this next slide then is just, uh, as I said, uh, really connected to, you know, the question you'd had about what does it look like? Is, is there an international coordinated response? And this is, again, one of the major areas we work on related to policy and influence, and this is, there, there are reams of paper written about what it should look like, how we respond, how we coordinate, how we collaborate, how do we work together, all to try and fight against the natural tendencies to compete, to be seen, to plant the flag, to, you know, to fundraise. Um, so, you know, yeah. I think the policies have to the extent possible been written to try and, and go against those natural tendencies of organizational health. <laughs> um, and, and egos, but you know we, that, that still comes in the. It can sometimes still you know hinder that. But in a perfect situation, you know this is what leadership looks like. This is how we have a, a common collective strategy that's prioritized. That's not set by the fact that you know my organization does work with this potential group, and thus I see that problem. You know, but really looking at where is the funding, which is always limited and never enough, where is it going so that we have agreed as a collective on um, the response that's going to be have the most impact for the population and actually it's most, um, uh, and, and most responsive to what the populations themselves are requesting. So that structure is kind of in place and this is a, a very, you know, this, this slide basically just demonstrates that, that that's there and there's, there's a lot to unpack beneath and behind all of this. But I'll, I'll stop it there to just say that's, you know, a bit of what we do. Um, and while our members are the ones on the ground actually working within these approaches, we try to ensure that their lessons, that they're learning, their frustrations, and the successes they have within these different approaches are brought forward and are recognized within the policy or addressed within policy changes, and that they themselves understand a little bit, as we call it, the rules of the game and, and what they can expect of others. Um, you know, and what is expected of them. Okay. Uh, Patty, let me go back. Would you explain OSHA for those who don't know that term? Okay. So OSHA is the United Nations Office of the Co Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance. It was created by a General Assembly resolution. It is an, I mean, hmm, <laughs> I explain OSHA. OSHA is, is a, in, it, in its purest form, it was created to coordinate uh, and not to basically have a dog in the fight, so to speak, amongst the UN agencies in, in a response. So to try and ensure that there was one, you know, information management structure, that there was one, there was clarity on leadership, that there was you know, someone who was bringing together the commonality of the response, the humanitarian response plan, as it's called, that was pulling together the appeal across the different agencies. Now, that's the design. In reality, it's okay. a bit different from that. They have expertise, but they are still pretty much the organization. If you're on the ground in the field and you want to know who's working in this sector or who I contact for this, they're the information source. They are the centrality of information. They are the, the reason it's not always that in reality. The the you know the the idea is because they don't always have the funding to actually implement in the way that they've kind of been defined and designed, and so you'll find some weaknesses in that. They've also been assigned duties over time that have developed since the General Assembly Resolution 25 years ago. So, for example, they now have a funding responsibility where they oversee the Central Emergency Response Fund. So they have um, a mechanism now for grant giving at country level that, of course, pulls their attention away and, and somewhat diminishes their honest broker relationship with individual organizations. They've taken on a role in terms of an expertise in civil military liaison work, which in more and more complex crises is becoming a greater part of their role, especially um, as they also look at humanitarian access issues. So, you know, again, these are things that, that pull their energies away from some of the pure information um, and coordination aspects of, of what they had done in the past. But it is a, it, it, I don't think it's a diminishment. It's more just a somewhat an overloading of them um, versus a, a decrease in their in their uh, focus on those areas. But they just have many other areas they also work on now. So they they don't always look exactly the same in every country because of the fact that the priorities of 
where the funding is and how that context um, decides what they should prioritize as an organization. Um, so certain times you'll see they don't have what you might expect them to have from another situation because of the funding. Uh, Julian, you wanted to jump in on that? Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe to add from an NGO perspective, I mean, OCHA is also a natural ally in country um, because they do not have any funding relationships with NGOs, uh, except through the full fund, but that's a little bit different. And so, it, 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 you know, if you are to, to, to arrive in a, in a crisis and to, uh, and to know what the gaps are in terms of the response, what the priorities are, um, it, it's an easy first point of entry to understand, you know, uh, who's doing what, where, um, what, what the type of level of funding is, and, and what the needs on the ground are. Um, so it, uh, historically, it's been, it's been uh, an organization that's been very important for, uh, for uh, NGOs working internationally. Okay. Patty, let me go back. When you use the word development, what do you mean? I mean, you talked about fundraising? No, sorry, development as in developing yeah. nations and their, their long-term development programming and, for example, health infrastructure or educational develop, um, structure, infrastructure, building up their schools, building up their ministries. The, you know, I mean, it, can't, there's some, you have middle-income countries. So it's it's yeah. community development. It's, it's community development. It's not fundraising. No, sorry, it, it is it's community development and governmental development, not fundraising. It's not the yeah. way that we use okay, the just, in terms of organizationally. No, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to point that out because it, it, it's a difference between between domestic and internationally, and that phrase is thrown around a lot. Let me go back to uh, the slide with the cluster approach and just drill down on this a little bit. So uh, I'm a new NGO that wants to get into international uh, uh, response and recovery. So. When you say that you're a, a thought leader and a convener, I mean, what does that mean to me as, as, as a new NGO in this field? And okay. I guess what I'm, I'm looking for as well is, is what is the practical value of, of joining interaction? Uh, okay. Well, the practical Young value. NGO, I'll, new in the I'll field. Start, I'll start with the practical value, which is, especially if you're a small NGO, yes. the the bandwidth required to kind of engage across the entirety of the system. So interaction okay. can help you drink a bit better. <laughs> you know, we can, we can basically okay, be your fair expert. Enough. Yeah. We can be your expert to say, you know, this is what I need to know, and we can tell you what you, the answers. Versus, how do I figure out what I need to know, and where do I get the answers? So. You know, one of the things is, is yeah, we, we can be a one-stop stop for a lot of um, orientation and, and understanding that would maybe take uh, staff commitment and time and energy that uh, isn't necessary uh, from, from a small NGO that, that's trying to explore how to, how to respond. Um, a second thing is, okay, let's say you were... Okay, give me a... Yeah? Go ahead. Would you want me to give you an example? I was going to have you give me a prank. Yes, please. Okay, so you want to go into a, uh, a crisis like Haiyan or even Haiti um, in the earthquake the, not the five years ago. No, I guess it's longer than that, no. Seven years ago. Um, and you, you can arrive, but you don't know which meetings to go to. You don't know who you should be talking to. You maybe are working in a very, you might be even doing a good project, but it's not connected with anyone else's programming. It might be duplicative. It might be, uh, you know, you're you're giving a you're look, planning on doing a distribution, and you arrive at the camp where you're doing the distribution, and there was a distribution done the day before, and you might say, well, how come I didn't know about that? Well, because you weren't connected to the cluster, and the cluster had made decisions and agreed and kind of divvied up camps to different individual organizations or, or amongst different organizations. They agreed on a specific approach. So maybe with the government, we've agreed that the shelter kit looks like X, and you arrive and you've got Y. And the government's like, what's going on? Why are you giving out the wrong stuff? We've agreed what we're going to be giving out. So we can help. Um, interaction can help a small NGO or even a large NGO that's just thinking of exploring humanitarian. We can help you navigate those initial stages of who should I be talking to? What does it look like? What should I, you know, as I said, what should I expect and what is expected of me? And when you get on the ground, we can also be the phone call that, you know, your theory of sorts for humanitarian to say, uh, I'm hearing this. Is that true? What about that? Can I not get that? 
And we get that, you know, we get those calls quite regularly, even from individuals who are currently working in the field. This isn't about just a small NGO de deciding to go into the field. We'll get NGO coordinators calling us um, saying, you know, I just walked out of an OCHA meeting and they're saying that, you know, for the pooled funding, they no longer need to, um, you know, have a discussion. They, they no longer need to give it to international NGOs or something like this, whatever. The, and we can say, actually, yes, that's true, or no, that's not true, and this is the policy document that will support your argument with them if, if it's not true. Sometimes we have to say to them, actually, yes, it's true, they can do that, and this is the policy document that supports that position on their part. So it's not always that we're necessarily, like, going to give you the argument you want to hear, but we can at least explain to you what it is that um, explains if from a policy perspective, or if there's no policy from a common practice perspective, what is uh, happening? Okay, so back to, back to the example of, uh, of, say, Haiti. Would you deploy liaisons into Port-au-Prince to help convene the membership? Yeah. Sorry, uh, Julie, do you want to, do you want to add that first? Or? Yeah, I mean, one point that, just to add, sorry, John, but uh, I, I mean, Patty talked about, you know, the reality in the field. There's also, in terms of a, a service, if you will, that that, uh, that we render as, as interaction is, you know, let's, going back to the Haiti example, Haiti strike, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the international uh, equivalent of FEMA, OFDA, which is part of USAID, the first people they'll call will be us to set up a meeting. Uh, have a discussion with members on what are the priorities. What are the priorities from our members? What are they seeing from the ground? What are they seeing from their teams on the ground when they see teams on the ground? And and that's also a big uh, a, a, a big role in the in, in the out in the onset uh, of, of the disasters uh, when it's a disaster or, or when the conflict uh, er, er, erupts is we're we're a platform for people to have a discussion and arrive to a common analysis even prior to going there from uh, from the Washington perspective. Now, in terms of do we deploy to a place like port au -Pont? I mean, actually, we did. That was before my time in interaction, but uh, we had done that for Haiti. It's unlikely we would do it again. It's the, the best coordination from an NGO perspective really is from the NGOs who are operational on the ground. So if there, was, if there was a request from the organizations on the ground for us to come in and support them in some special way or to give, you know, and, and hey, those kind of crises are, are, you know, hopefully once every five years, once every decade if we're very lucky. So it's not a big ask that we would be come in and we would be asked to come in and support. But if there was, we would, you know, we would explore that. However, for many crises, the... You know, you can coordinate all you want, but if the NGOs on, on the ground aren't ready for it, you're, not, you're going to be frustrated. You're not going to get very far. So what we'll often do, and this is a, a special area of work that we do have, which is we work with NGO coordination for us who are actually operational on the ground. We help them. We help strengthen them. We help convince donors of the importance of them. We, we train them, make sure they're aware of current policies. So we try and ensure that the individuals who are on the ground doing the work, who may be working for entirely different organizations, who, you know, they definitely don't work for interaction, um, that they are the most uh, capable possible for the response and what's needed at that time. And so it's, while it's not about us responding maybe directly, we do try and ensure that when NGOs are ready to be coordinated, that they get the best support that they can for that mechanism. And can you give me some examples of that support? Yeah, Julian, do you want to maybe mention some so of the like, Yeah, you've got you got fifteen members in Port au Prince. Yeah. Um, everything is well, chaos in, in on Port the ground. Oach is just getting up. In Port in Port au Prince, Go ahead, Julian. you have got an NGO coordination body which is called PCO. So basically we're in contact with um, with, with their person there. And every time uh, they, they basically were available uh, almost as a help desk if they have any questions re re regarding either policy right. or if they have specific uh, operational uh, issues that they need to deal with. The other, you know, then there's all the admin questions. You know, they set up their own bylaws, their own governance structures, and we make sure that, or we don't, we, we make sure that all the NGO coordination bodies that pop up organically in crises. Uh, are, are equipped with this knowledge and are equipped with each other's uh, terms of reference and whatnot. 
And then what we do here is once a year we actually bring them all together here uh, for, for a meeting for two or three days to kind of align our positions, share our challenges, and try to exchange best practices. So there's, there, this, this is a, a, a few examples, if you will. So it, it, has, it can have yeah. to do with the architecture that Patty was describing. It can have to do with, uh, with government issues. It can have to do with, with security or targeting of aid workers and, 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 their, own and how governance. To make it, their own governance. So we're just we, we're just almost like a, a, an available support function for them, and the, the, the issue for us is to make sure that they're aware that, that that this is available to them, because when they are, they usually use us uh, to, to to the best effect. Okay, let me drill down one more. So, so say I'm this this new NGO, and I just joined Interaction. Uh, I, I self-deploy. The agency goes into Haiti, although it has no footprint there. Uh, I call you for advice. I say, look, I've just got into Port-au-Prince. What do I do as far as the cluster system goes? What would be your advice? Are you a member? Yes. Sorry. No, I. I'm <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I say that a, bit, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but realistically, I mean, we would definitely attempt to assist you, but we also, I mean, I, I want to be careful that we kind of offer that we would be of assistance to, to you know, various um, organizations that may, may respond to a, a crisis close to home, where, you know, such as Haiti, where, you know, we could be opening ourselves up to, to giving advice to, to quite a, a number of organizations. Um, but, you know, definitely if there was, um, you know, we meet regularly with organizations, and this could be by phone as well, organizations that are exploring how, how to work or how to change um, in terms of, you know, either changing it by going into the humanitarian sphere, um, they could be American or, or international. We've had many meetings with even international organizations that are trying to figure out what, what kind of supports they could be providing, uh, what kind of approaches they could be having. So. We don't close our doors off to anyone who's looking for information. I do think that, um, you know, one of the first pieces of advice we would give you, though, especially if you weren't a member, is have you reached out to OCHA and have you connected with OCHA, which is the United Nations agency, you know, responsible for coordination, and also probably putting you in touch with if there was an NGO forum on the ground saying, you know, and also have a conversation with the NGO forum. Because a lot of the contextual issues, we wouldn't, have at our fingertips if you were actually already on the ground in Haiti. But if you were talking about, yeah. you know, you were still back in the U.S. and you were saying, we are thinking of moving into the humanitarian realm, what are some of the things we can do to educate ourselves better, what are some of the things we should be looking at, you know, then it's a very, you know, quite a different conversation in terms of, okay, well, how do we help you understand what this looks like and what are some of the things you should know or could know to be more effective in the collective response and might be what might be some of the peer organizations that might be worth you also talking to because they have commonalities in, in, in sectors or commonalities in approach that, you know, maybe would also be worth you exploring and hearing from. Okay, let me let me just sort of wrap this up, and, I, and I'm thinking about folks who are hearing about the cluster approach for the first time. Um, so again, going back, I'm, I'm a new member, I'm on the field, I guess I'm looking for some practical advice. You gave me some already, I think, on how this cluster system works. Um, and I guess I'm looking for the liaison points of how I would get into this network, uh, as simple as that sounds. But I'm, I'm interested in folks who have no idea what the cluster system is and how it works. So if you could just say something quickly on that. Well, I mean, so you know, as you see on the, on, you know, globally, uh, each cluster has been assigned uh, most, for most of them to a UN, UN agency. So basically what you would do in country is you would go to OCHA, you would ask for the, the, the cluster lead. So there is an off of official cluster lead. So let's say you work in nutrition uh, and you, that's, that's, that's your area of expertise. You would go to cluster meetings held at UNICEF by the cluster lead. Uh, and within those meetings, that happens, you know, it, when it's a when it's a really quick onset, it usually happens once a week. After that, uh, when it's when when it's a protracted situation, it's more like once a month. And during those meetings, you will you will be able to know who's active, where, uh, doing what, and what are the gaps. And this is where you know the the essential um, the essential discussion uh, arrive. To get the contact of that person, I mean, we have those in Washington, so we could give them before you go. 
but as Patty would say, we would recommend going through through OCHA or the NGO for, forum if there is one to kind of get it to the nitty gritty and say, oh, well, maybe the cluster coordinator is not that good. You better see the deputy. You know, those little contextual things that you need to know. Or, you know, you're looking at, at working in this, in this, uh, in this county, uh, in this county, it's better to talk to this, to this organization. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, John, but uh, that's the normal. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, yeah, and what I'm looking for is just real practical information on, I get on the ground, how do I, I introduce myself to OCHA, I figure out what areas I can possibly work in, you know, when, where are those cluster meetings. Uh, I can get intel from those from those meetings. I can form partnerships with those meetings. Uh, there's a lot of information I can get from the cluster system. Uh, let me switch to Sphere in the interest of time. So I think that's the next slide. So Julian, you're on the board. Uh, can you give us a quick overview? What is the Sphere project? Yeah, so um, I mean, there's a lot of slides. There's a lot of words, so apologies for those on the phone. I won't go through them. It's more as a reference point. Um, I, I think what's interesting about the Sphere project is uh, it, it really originated from the grassroots and from the actual people in the field. It's not some some golden uh, standard that was parachuted on on you know humanitarian workers. Um, what originated uh, the Sphere project was actually the Rwanda crisis in 1994. Um, that uh, for all those involved was pretty messy, uh, and and people didn't really know. You know who was doing what and, and at what levels, and there was very little accountability. And so I, I think a lot of the organizations, and that was the big emergency of the day, that were in, involved decided to collectively get together and sector by sector uh, define minimum standards uh, that would be acceptable uh, to everyone that are real, from really from a practitioner's uh, from a pr practitioner's perspective. So that's the origin of it. <coughs> But I think it's very important to really ground this to the fact that Sphere is very much field-driven in its conception and still now in the way that it's revised. So um, as, as, we, as we speak, we are on the third version of Sphere, and actually 2017 is, is going to be the fourth revision uh, of the handbook. So the, okay. the way uh, – yeah, go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say, again, I've got a foot in the domestic and a foot in international, so I'm always intrigued on the differences in language. Um, so talk to me about the humanitarian charter and human rights, because uh, after training domestically for a number of years, rarely do I go into trainings that start with humanitarian charter and human rights. Right. So uh, I, I think that that's what unites us all together on the on on uh, the humanitarian side is, is you know the humanitarian principles uh, the code of conduct that uh, all organizations or, or most organizations that that, that work internationally uh, have signed up to uh, to be a member of interaction you also have to have self-certified against those and so to go back to the humanitarian uh, imperative I mean it's, it's really looking at it from uh, from a, a human ah, empathy sorry. perspective, sorry, there's a lot of uh, feedback on the line. Uh, but also from a from a legal uh, framework perspective, uh, in the sense that international humanitarian law has been uh, signed up um, by most countries, uh, is, is 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 followed up by the by the, the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. And these principles that we abide by uh, guide everything that, that, that we do. And the, the main principle of these is when it's conflict to be, to be neutral and not to be serving one, one part of the population uh, versus the other. Um, and, and to deliver assistance in terms of need and not necessarily in terms of mandate. And that goes back a little bit to, to what Patty was saying uh, before. So these these are the underpinnings. The humanitarian imperative is is the underpinning, both legal and 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 moral, if you will, that then defines what um, what the core principles uh, are. Um, and 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 there there it's, we look into the protection principles, which are which are very much human rights uh, based. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but this this yeah it helps. Yeah, to it, it's it's. Sector. Yeah, absolutely. Often I've trained in the states, and I've had I, I've given the example that that in urban communities it's not very cool to serve pork hot dogs. 
Okay, and and I've gotten the response sometimes that look, uh, you know, if they're hungry, they're going to eat, and and this is charity. So I, I want to throw that out. That's not a criticism. It's just that I've I've had that response in in different corners in the country. So so the humanitarian imperative is it charity work? No, it's not charity work because part of the part of the code of conduct and and is is really the concept of dignity and and to recognize the the right to dignity to every human being. And if, if what you propose as food is not, <laughs> is not uh, culturally appropriate, uh, then it's act you actually uh, undermine that principle. So just find okay, something else. And you know, it's not hot dog or nothing. Is okay, let's get some chicken. Uh, that would be the good programming. <laughs> and that would be the standard. Yeah. Uh, and, and Julian, uh, folks can go to the Sphere Project online and download the handbook. Yeah, there's a PDF version that's that's available for free, and you also have a you, you also have a a web a web friendly uh, version of it that's also available for free, and then you can actually order um, the the actual handbook. Um, and we're actually working uh, as part of the fourth revision um, at having an app uh, that would bring together both the the Sphere project and and what we call companion standards that have been developed around other uh, sectors like uh, market assessment, like uh, economic recovery, um, like livestock. Um, they, they basically uh, accepted the sphere premise of the humanitarian charter as we've defined it, and basically the, um, the structure of sphere and, and, and therefore their, their uh, they have the stamp, if you will, that they've been approved by the Sphere Project, and they're part of the broader family. And within the handbook, it will describe the humanitarian charter and the history behind that, going back to Eleanor Roosevelt in the UN, um, human rights, how the work is based on human rights, and also life with dignity, which I always think is, is a good phrase to use as often as possible. Let me just throw in a, another quick question on the way you guys work. Um, Often, uh, domestically, we don't, we don't hear the terms evaluation, monitoring, and accountability as much as I think we should. And I don't speak for all agencies, but just those that, that I know really well. Um, how important that is that uh, within the sphere world, the international world, to make sure that we hit evaluation, monitoring, accountability? Well, I think that's, uh, that, that's kind of the, 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 the raison d'etre, if you will, of this. Uh, of the CR project is to be more accountable, uh, so to, to define common standards that we could all be measured against. And they're minimum standards. Some of them are aspirational as much as, as, as they are, uh, but then we all have the same yardstick. Uh, I think they're essential in terms, the, and they've been recognized as essential by, by most because uh, uh, we're not following the slides, and, and that's perfectly fine, but at the end, you, you I actually have a list of all the countries that have uh, espoused the sphere standard as, as part of their domestic uh, uh, monitoring evaluation and, and, and standard definition. So, and that's countries that are affected by disasters uh, as well as donor countries. So for instance, um, if you submit a proposal on water and sanitation to the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance from USAID, um, and, and and part of the work of the work is let's say to to, to drill boreholes in, in a displaced camp. The the expectation for you in the proposal is to use the sphere standard in terms of the distribution of water, which is, is one of the most quoted ones, which is 15 liters of water per person per day. So that's the standard that you should try to reach, and that's the one that will be in the proposal. So in that sense. Um, you are you, you are um, accountable in terms of what the minimum standards are recognized to be, and this is what you're supposed to deliver to the beneficiary. And that that's also a field guide. So if we're in the field trying to put together proposals and trying to evaluate and set up programs, those standards help us develop those programs. How much water do you need for this refugee camp? You know, how much whatever. So that's also the thing with Sphere that it's a, it's a field guide. Yes, it's absolutely a field guide, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's what will define how you do your work, uh, and and I, I think this is what why it's been so successful is uh, your your water and sanitation engineer that that you know has a university training in this uh, goes into the humanitarian field, be it you know 
a, a, a U.S. staff or, you know, a, a Kenyan staff, that will be their reference on how to do the work in humanitarian settings. Um, and, and, and the yardstick to measure themselves and to, and to know what to do. It, it also helps in, in cluster discussions, just to you know, bring it back to how does this actually impact within the wider architecture, is if you're having a debate or a discussion, uh, put a more positive spin on it, on how to assist populations in a certain setting, and there's a disagreement amongst different experts in a sector, you can sometimes call upon the sphere standards to say, okay, well, what, what, is, what has been agreed across you know, globally about what we should, where's our starting point, and why are we changing that? What, what are we adapting to it? It's, and it's not that sphere has the answer for everything. Of course it does not. But it sets some parameters which can kind of help frame and, and guide and, and push towards a more common approach than, than you might have had, you know, than you had before sphere existed. Um, and it definitely helps in that way because it, it's accepted across NGOs, it's accepted across the United Nations. A lot of donors require, you know, notation of, of your adherence to sphere and your proposals for humanitarian yeah. responses. So there's a lot of reinforcers for, for the importance of it and the, and the role that it plays. And okay. Just, uh, Let, go ahead, Charlie. No, I just wanted to say that to, to, to your point about the fact that it's, it's not just this, it's just not a, only a standard. It defines what are the key actions to look for, and it has some key um, guidance notes. So, okay, how should I get there? What should I be thinking uh, as I am uh, looking to reach that standard? Okay, let, let me ask, in the interest of time, um, let me ask both of you, uh, what do you think are some of the differences between domestic and international work? It's, it's uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say because we have very little, uh, I think, uh, experience in, uh, in, in the domestic uh, realm. I, I do think that our, the international realm is much more codified, uh, and to some extent what we're both talking about today is about the, the codification, if you will, both on the, on the programmatic side, which is what sphere is, defining what the standards are from a programmatic side and from a principle side, and from what Patty was describing, which is more what is the coordination architecture uh, and the whole system. So it's very codified. My impression, but really from an outsider, is that the domestic realm is, is you know, maybe more what the international realm was uh, in, you know, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, but hasn't been codified as much probably because there's more resources available from the domestic side. I would just add one other thing, and this is an area where I think the humanitarian community is struggling to adapt to a degree um, and could potentially learn from the domestic side is we're not always quite sure how to work with functioning government. And, you know, not to say that you guys always have the liber uh, luxury of working with functioning governments because I think functioning can be defined in many different ways. but. Um, you know, especially in complex emergencies where, you know, man-made crises, the populations we're trying to serve are, are actually often at risk from their own government. And so the assistance we're giving is in a little bit of a vacuum. Now, one of the things that's changing over time is as we're seeing conflicts, for example, occurring in middle-income countries or, you know, upper middle-income countries as Syria was before the conflict. Um, as Jordan is before they take on so, took on so many refugees, it, it's a it's a very different uh, approach than than I think we are used to, which is how do we um, blend what a lot of the codification that was developed because of the vacuum impact, um, and vacuum can also be a country that's functioning, but their entire you know uh, governmental infrastructure was wiped out in the crisis, such as happened in Haiti. Um, or, or it can happen in the Philippines where, you know, they just, the government is at that time absorbed with their own personal uh, responsiveness and not quite staffed up. And so we are, you know, that's one of the challenges we have, which is, okay, if Jordan has a specific approach to how they want to do education inside Jordan, how do we then bring in some of the lessons we've had related to how you assist refugees in a camp setting into, you know, a connectivity to their own infrastructure, their own development agenda and their approach. So I, I think there's some lessons, and we kind of see this more as the humanitarian development nexus, and, you know, from the international side is how, how do humanitarians, you know, 
in, in, in some of these settings uh, blend more seamlessly with our, our again, global development, not the fundraising side, the, our global development um, colleagues, and, and figure out, you know, how, how that works and how our programming can be somewhat connected to a larger, um, you know, government strategy for development of its nation and, and moving towards the sustainable development goals. So there's there's definitely complexities there that, that we're grappling with that maybe you do have, have more experience with. Um, you also, I think, have, have some resources at times that we don't um, in terms of just our private giving and donations. I, I think you, you maybe also um, struggle with some of the gift and kind approaches that we've kind of, again, codified some rules around. Um, in terms of, you know, please don't just send us um, truckloads of winter coats because we're in the middle of, um, you know, the continent of Africa and they don't need winter coats. So, and, and, and in kind of a lot of conversations about, you know, the, the cost of shipping items, the cost of storing items, the cost of, you know, and I, I think in the U.S. you probably have, um, you know, maybe there's some learning we could do, you know, cross-fertilization there as well in terms of, you know, things that we've been able to, to accomplish within that realm about, you know, cash is best approaches to, to giving. This is yeah, Cameron. Real quick, just oh. wanted to give a four-minute warning. Just want to let you guys know that. Okay. Great, Cameron. Just a couple of things, real quick. Cameron or Julian, you made the you made the comment that that um, the states has more resources. Uh, do you think that's a plus? I don't know. I, again, I, I don't have a different. I, I don't have a clear idea of what it is. It's, it's a plus. Potentially, it's a plus, but it also can can create. Uh, I presume uh, more more competition and more duplication if there's no strong coordination. I think. Uh, the advantage, at least on paper, of the international system is it's very coordinated. Uh, the disadvantage sometimes for us is it's so coordinated that it becomes a big bureaucracy that doesn't necessarily deliver as much as it should. Uh, but my impression, and again, this is all impressions, uh, you, you are all here to, 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 uh, to confirm or infer what I'm saying, is that sometimes on the domestic front, there is, the coordination is not necessarily very, very well done if it's, uh, if it's a major crisis. I think what we learned, you know, we used to be both Patty and I in, in international in an international organization when uh, Katrina hit, and and that organization was actually called uh, uh, called uh, to Louisiana to come because uh, it was so big and it was so messy that experience of organizations that had a, that had international experience of the coordination structure was useful to them in the in you know in the first phases of it, which kind of to me, points to, 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 to something here. Okay, and then is there what can we do to to uh, to to help you with access to to our agencies, our way of working? Um, is there anything we can do to help help you um, access? To, especially in a catastrophic incident when you're going to come in possibly. And I remember that in Katrina because a number of international agencies were asked in because we, we weren't used to uh, IDPs or IDP camps on, on how, how are we going to move and, and shelter these large populations. So anything on that, how can we help? I, I think these webinars are sharing information. I mean, you know, this one has kind of been us, but maybe a, another one where we, we hear from you guys about our about topics that you guys are grappling with and, and how what, what guidance you would give to us. I mean, I, I think the as with anything, you know, the first step is the building the relationship. And if we can build the relationship and open up those uh, understandings of each other, then then you know, they'll slowly become clearer where the, the points of, of Cross fertilization are our best uh, best spent where where the time is best spent. Okay, I think that's a great note to end on. And Cameron, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Julian and Patty. I enjoyed that. Great. And um, yes, and thank you. And, and yeah, you know, thank you everybody who joined our first uh, three webinars. Um, Patty and Julian, I, I definitely learned a lot uh, from both of you, and, and some of those lessons you were talking about are very similar in international and domestic response, so I think that was helpful for our audience. Uh, and John, thank you very much for facilitating. Uh, also wanted to mention some people behind the scenes, such as Michelle Thompson, Joe Chu, 
uh, and Justin and Chris from Envoad have helped put this together. They've done a, a ton of work on this. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope you have a good day. We will be hosting a second uh, one of these webinars in the near future, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, and if we weren't able to address uh, any questions you have today, please feel free to send those to us in the email, and we will uh, make sure they're integrated into our next webinar. So thank you, everybody, and have a good day.